Good morning. Welcome back to AccessTV.org. Uh, this is Pastor Marcus Messiah Jarvis. This is my program called We Sing. It's all about the power of praise and worship. I said last week that we would be back out in the field, but due to extenuating circumstances, we're going to be in-house this Sunday. As you can see, I am here. Um, I'm going to come from the book of Revelation. It's not a book that many people, in my experience, preach from or teach from. But being that we're here in the last days, I do believe, in, a, in accordance to the prophetic word of God, uh, testifies to, uh, again, I'm going to be coming from the book of Revelation. But before I begin, I, I like to pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have woken us up this morning. We did not wake ourselves up, but you woke us up this morning. And if we have you on our minds, you have kept us in our right mind. And now I pray that I decrease and that the power of the Holy Spirit increase, that you could use this vessel, your servant, a slave to Christ, to bring forth your message of salvation and the teaching of the people in the Bible. Now, before I get into, uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking about the Church of Laodicea, but before I get into that, you know, as I was studying uh, the book of Revelation, God uh, uh, said to do an in-depth study. And so I wanted to, to talk about the person who actually wrote the book of Revelation. It was a divinely inspired word of God given to the apostle known in the English as John, but in the Hebrew, his name was Yohanan. And uh, these Israelites, they, they look like me. They were of a darker hue people. Uh, some were bronze skinned. Some were darker than myself, and some even charcoal black. So I just want to kind of give you a, a, an image, a physical image of Yohanan uh, in the Bible. Uh, it was also attributed to what, whom we know as John, that John was probably Jesus' best friend. Everywhere you look in the Bible, when the disciples scattered, you always see that John remained. When Jesus was brought before Pontius Pilate, uh, we see that John remained outside while he was being questioned. Uh, it was John who was at the cross whom Christ said to Peter, this is, uh, this is my beloved, and whom Jesus gave care, uh, gave the care of, uh, of his mother into John's hands. And so I just want to, con uh, John was also named amongst the three uh, that Jesus named, uh, I think it's pronounced in the Hebrew, Boanangers, which means the sons of thunder. And so I just, you know, kind of want to give you, uh, you know, uh, uh, an image of the character, the personality, and the, uh, and the physical depiction of, of these men, uh, and specifically John. Now, I had to ask myself, why did Jesus call John, uh, I think, believe James and one other, he said, these are the sons of thunder. Well, if you look throughout the scripture, John was not one of these, like, you know, passive aggressive kind of people. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was going someplace and entered into a village and was looking for a place to stay and was denied a place to stay, it was John who said, shall we call down fire from heaven and burn up their houses? So John was a very zealous and on fire and warrior and soldier for the Lord. These were not these uh, uh, timid images that we can sometimes draw from the Shakespearean writing in the King James Version. But these were Hebrews. These were Israelites um, that were on fire for God, that were willing to die and go through all types of tribulation for the purpose of, of testifying of the salvation of Jesus to the entire world. Now, John was banished to the island of Patmos where he wrote these letters to the seven churches where the divine revelation of the book of Revelation was given to him because he was testifying of the message of salvation through Jesus and he was teaching the teaching of Jesus. So the Romans and now uh, uh, gathered John, John up and left him on this island of Patmos. Now, so I want to give you a, a, a geographical image as well. Patmos is, is part of the Aegean Sea. 
and it's located near Turkey and Libya and Syria. It's also adjacent to Greek, to Greece and Sicily and, and, and Italy and Rome. And so, but it, it's, it's such a small island. Um, and the island means, the name of the island means a sterile island or the killing because nothing grew there. It was a, a, a rocky uh, uh, region with no plant growth and, and, and very little animal life. And so John is banished here uh, for preaching the gospel of Jesus. And, and today we have people that profess Christ as their savior, maybe not here in the United States, but in the world abroad, who are being treated uh, almost as such as John, if not worse, their, their lives are being taken from them. And so we have what I call a comfortable Christian walk here in the Americas. And so, again, I, I want to paint this picture for you. So here you have Yohanan banished by the Romans for preaching the gospel of Jesus on the island of Patmos, a barren place, a place uh, with very little food substance. You know, I mean, I can imagine, you know, uh, uh, John being on this island without water uh, and without provisions and maybe just uh, the Roman ship just sailed off to, onto the shores of the island of Patmos and dumped him off with whatever he had. And maybe he had his writing scrolls uh, with him. So he was able to write us these letters. And here's a man whose faith is being tried because because of his faith and belief in Jesus, he's been thrown into a place with very little provisions. And sometimes in our own life, we find ourselves in this type of situation and fear steps in or doubt steps in. Uh, when when really it's time to praise God and to worship God. Um, because if you read in the beginning of the book of Revelation, John says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant, John, who bear record of the word of God and the te testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. And he went through great trials and tribulation to do so. I want to, okay, John the seventh, okay, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, uh, there's somewhere, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, he says. And in the kingdom of patience of Jesus Christ was in the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here's John telling you, I'm your companion in tribulation. So even though John was banished to this island, his faith never wavered. He remained steadfast in his faith and his steadfast in his zeal for the Lord. He was not looking at his present situation. And a lot of times in, in the Americas, we are, we are spoiled Christians or we've been Christianized. Uh, we have more than enough, and yet we're still not satisfied and want more. And this, is, uh, my, this will segue into later on my, my uh, commentary on John's letter to the church of Laodicea, because we have become like that. But I, I want to stay on John. So here, here's, here's a man that... Maybe had it been me, or maybe had it been you, we have to ask ourselves, would we still have the tenacity and the integrity that John had, that even in the midst of his circumstances, he was able to write down the book of Revelation. He opened up his heart and his mind to God in a situation where some people would be like, Lord, why, why, why here? Why now? Why is this happening to me? It's just been one thing after another. Now I'm stuck on this island with no food and no water, and, and here I'm going to die. But we know that did not happen to John because Jesus prophesied that his days would be long on the earth, and we know that John lived to be an old age where many of the disciples were, were, uh, were killed and crucified. And so it made, it, it, it made me take a look and re-examine my life and say, do I have the zeal? Am I on fire? Would Christ consider me or would Christ consider you to be one of the sons of thunder? Are you on fire for God? Do you have a zeal for God? Do you have a knowledge of God? Do you have a relationship with him? Is your faith grounded? Because 
I, I, I dare to say that the scriptures prophesy that we have some difficult days ahead. November election is approaching us fast, and it seems to be that we have no candidacy that represents our moral fiber as Christians. The world is in complete turmoil. There is hunger strikes all over the place. There are famine in the land all over the globe. There's war on every continent. We have terrorist attacks right here in the United States. We have a uh, a what I feel to be a brewing race war. Uh, we have uh, class wars, rich against poor, uh, the, the the capitalistic elite uh, uh, just fleecing the people. We have a church that exists in a state of an apostasy where they're changing the laws of God uh, 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 and sitting in the temple of God as a god. And so I, I, I look at John and, and you could say that some of the same things were going on in his time. You had the Roman persecution of the Christians. You had the Jews and the 10 tribes splitting and fighting one another. And you had all the different ites that were fighting Israel. But here's John holding steadfast to his faith. And so today we have some difficult days ahead, according to the prophecy of this book. And so the Bible says that we should examine ourselves. And so I put it to you today to examine yourself. Are you living a life that's sold out to Jesus uh, or are you uh, halfway in the world or halfway in the church? You have not yet uh, given your life uh, over to the Lord. You have not yet fully surrendered. And so therefore you are not on fire. And so now I'll go into the John is writing the letter to the seven churches. Now, they could apply to the seven churches of that day, but Bible is also prophetic. And they definitely apply to the churches that exist in the world now. And so I want to read from Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. But let me stop here. Let me make sure I've covered everything. Okay, so John is writing to the seven churches, and he gets to Revelation 3, uh, chapter 13, verse 14, and he says, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen. One thing I want to note here for those that uh, are paying attention, and I hope you're taking notes, this is the first time in the Bible that we hear Christ being called the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. He says to the church of Laodicea, I know thy works that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were. Now, before I go further, you know, I said, look, where is this place Laodicea? So I began to do some research and Laodicea at the time was a place located 50 miles southeast of another place called Philadelphia and the Lysias River Valley near Colossae and Hierapolis. Its name means people ruling. Laodicea means people ruling, not God ruling, but people ruling, and represents the unbelieving materialistic church of all ages. If you, if you look uh, at where Laodicea is located, it is surrounded by two other provinces. One, if you went to that province, their springs were full of cold, cold water. And on the other side of them was another place where the springs were hot and people went for healing. But both these uh, uh, provinces' water flowed into Laodicea. And so the water, even the water in Laodicea, the physical water was lukewarm and caused much sickness. So you see that our life, our spiritual life, Manifest manifests itself in the physical. For well, the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Laodicea was famous for its wealth, its bankers, its medical schools, and its popular eye salves or medicinals, and its textile industries. Yet Christ says that they were poor. So in verse 16, he says, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have not need of nothing. And knowest not thou that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So here Jesus is telling him you're rich 
but you're poor. And he begins to describe them. You're rich in material things. And it reminds me of the United States right now and the state of the church. We have wealth beyond measure. And all the world became rich because of us. Uh, the U.S. currency outside of the euro is the number one currency in the world. And all other currencies are measured against it. And it reminds me of the mystery Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18. It says, and all the world became rich because of her wealth. But yet we are poor in spirit. Uh, if you look at the moral fiber or the moral compass of America, we are slowly declining into a state of where the Bible says we make evil seemingly fair. We call that which is evil good and that which is good evil, where, where if it feels good, you do it. Uh, and so much so that there really is no separation of church and state. There is no separation of the secular world and secular people to the people of God and the, and the body of Christ or what, uh, or what people would uh, claim to be the body of Christ. They don't look any different. We dress the same. Uh, uh, matter of fact, if you turn the lights off in some of our churches and took away the lyrics, you'd think you was at the club listening to club music. But yet the church will call itself blessed. Uh, we have prosperity preachers uh, nowadays that it seem to have overtaken. We have churches that uh, their tithe brings in millions and millions and millions of dollars a year. We have uh, just in the black church alone, it is, it is stated that $142 billion flowed through just the black church, quote unquote, uh, this past year here in the United States of America. But yet if you look at the state of America right now, there is brewing a civil war, there is brewing a race war, and the church is no longer the church that we read about in the Bible. As a matter of fact, we even practice pagan religions and do not even keep the feast of the Lord. And so I want to go back. It says, because thou sayest I am enriched and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? Jesus is saying to them, you may have things, but spiritually you are poor. You are blind. You cannot see. You know, the Bible says in the last days that God would send them a spirit of delusionment because they refuse to receive the truth. We have a watered down version of the Bible now. We have bread that is not unleavened. Uh, sin has been added into the water, and now it's no longer the word of God. It's man's thoughts and man's desire. It is a church ruled by the people, just as the government here is ruled by the people. It is not a church ruled by the commandments and the laws decreed by Jesus and by his Father, our God. And so Jesus says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be a clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And so the message today that rings strong across the geographical confines of America and even the world is a message of repentance. We need to turn away from our secular mindset and turn towards God's face, not always seeking his hands for things, but turn toward his face, turn toward the cornerstone, turn toward the cap that, 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 that sits on the body and seek out the mind of God that will govern the behavior of the body. For the Bible says that this, if the same spirit that dwelled in Christ, that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, it will mortify or control the deeds of the body. But we are not governed by our flesh if we live in the spirit. It also says that these people have lost their faith. They don't believe. They don't have a fear or a reverence of God. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Even now, Jesus is standing at the door of your heart and the door of your mind. Even through me, his messenger and many others who declare 
the word of the word, the word of the Lord and the message of salvation, God is using us to knock on the doors of your heart and the doors of your mind saying, open up to me and I will come in and have fellowship with you and I will sup with you. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me to him that overcometh. Now, that word stands out right there. You know, to be a Christian nowadays means to go against the grain. It means to be politically incorrect. It means to be uh, set aside. Set aside is another word to, to mean sanctified or uh, like the Bible says, be ye holy that I am holy. Not that it's my righteousness, but it's the righteousness of Christ within me. It's the blood of Jesus that I'm washed in. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that governs and guides my steps that will help me to overcome, that will help you to overcome the present age that we're living in now. Our schools are teaching things that are contrary to the laws of God and the commandments of God. And we've, be, we've become a state, what I call, of coddleism. Uh, well, God loves us all, and you know, therefore all things are permitted because love covers a mul multitude of sin. But Paul preaches against this when he says, should I continue in grace? that sin may abound, God for, I mean, should I continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid that we use grace as a license to sin. No, it does not work like this. Jesus said that he would send us the comfort of the Holy Spirit that would teach us in all things. Psalm 119 says that he would write his laws on the table of our heart. So we don't do things from a legalistic perspective anymore, but we do it because we love him. That's why Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so we got stuck on love and left the commandments out. And we said, well, it's just all about love and we can just do what we feel like and God will just look over it. No, that is not so. Because Jesus said, I have not, when I come back, I'm not coming to bring peace, but a sword to set at variance the mother against the daughter, the father against the son, sibling against sibling. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, it says one shall be, two shall be in the field, one shall be taken and one shall be left. You never know the person lying next to you. It could be your husband, it could be your wife, it could be the members of your own household, your children, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, and you'll be taken or they'll be taken, but one of you is going to be left. Not everyone is going to enter into the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus said many would come in his name. He wasn't talking about Muslims. He wasn't talking about uh, 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 Buddhists. He wasn't talking about the Hare Krishnas. He wasn't talking about atheists or even the agnostics. No, he was talking to those that professed that they belonged to him, that professed his name. And he says, many shall come in my name in the last thing, saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy your name? Did we not heal the sick in your name? Did we not do this in your name? And he says to them, get thee far from me, you workers of evil. I don't even know you. And so here he says to him that overcometh this age, this time that we're living in now, he said, well, I grant to, I, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father and his brother. Jesus right here is using his own life as an example. God came in the form of flesh to show us the way that we might see, hear, smell, taste, and touch him to know that there is the way that he is the way. He's the only way. He is the truth and the life that will redeem mankind back to its creator, that we might have fellowship with him. That's why he's saying right here, I stand at the door and knock, open up and let me in. I know that from Adam you fell, but I've come that you might have life. I'm here knocking on the doors of your heart that you might once again, like Adam before he fell, have fellowship with me and sit with me on the right hand in the throne of God with my father. And so today we have become, it is as self-evident, you cannot deny it that, the, that America, the church, 
in America or that which calls itself the church of Christ in America has become like the church of Laodicea. We have pastors and congregants that have millions of dollars, yet and still you can walk into uh, impoverished neighborhoods where there's a church on every corner and not feel the divine presence of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, Hartford, Connecticut has over 300 and some odd churches, but when you get off at the train station at Union Square, when you get off at the bus station on the Greyhound or the Peter Pan at Union Square, I dare to ask somebody, do you feel the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit? Does it feel like, does it appear that we have a church on every corner, in every corner of the city, not just in the north end of Hartford? not just in the south end of Hartford. And if you go further out into the state of Connecticut, known as the Constitution State, every town and every province was established by those big white churches. But when you go into those townships, do their government represent the moral fiber of God? Are their mayors, are their, are their the governor of the state, are their congressmen, are their councilmen, are their legislators, are there people in the educational system, are there people in the, in the uh, position of authority to police us? Are their moral fibers grounded in the word of God? Or are our people not represented at all in the church and out of the church, even though we have much and we have very little? We run to prosperity preachers telling us God is going to bless you with a good job. God is going to bless you with a, a big house. God is going to bless you with a new car. God is going to bless you with a great wife. God is going to bless you with a great husband. All these things, 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 when the Bible clearly states, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness and all these things things will be added unto you. You won't have to look for them. You won't have to search after them. But today, if you turn around, you look and there's every, every five minutes, there's a new business coming up, a new multi-level marketing. And now the church is even engulfed in it. We're running after money and not running after the person that provides. We're not running after God. We're running after a prosperous life, but we're not running after a rich life in Jesus. And so Jesus is telling the church, Church of Laodicea, I know that thou, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were, because if you was cold, I could bring you to a point of repentance. If you was hot, I could use you to further the kingdom of God. But because you got one foot in the church and one foot in the club, one foot in the church and one foot in the, in the world, the only thing that I can do with you is spew thee out of my mouth. And then he says, I counsel thee. He's, he's, he's saying, repent, repent, turn away from those things and turn back to me that I might come in and that you might come in and sup with me and sit with me on my throne, even as he overcame and sits down at the right hand of the father. And in the end, it says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the church. That is the message that God gave for me to you today. Examine your life. Examine your faith. Are you rooted and grounded in the word? Would God, like John, consider you to be one of the sons of thunder? Like Jeremiah, when he walked into a province, the governments at that time would tremble for fear what would come out of his mouth. God is looking for people like the sons of thunder, that no matter what we go through, no matter what situation we may find ourselves in, whether we are, are base or whether we are bound, whether we have lots of money or where we, whether we don't have money at all, that the thing we chase after is God. We seek his face every morning, all day long, late in the, in the midnight hours. We study his word. We're engulfed in him. We are zealous for him. We are servants to him. We are a slave to Christ, as Paul said. If that is you, I want to encourage you. Uh, our services are Sunday at 3 p.m. at 181 Collins Street. Come to the tabernacle. We want to fellowship with you. And if that's not you, we want you to come so that you can be set on fire, so that the spark in me or the spark in somebody else will set you aflame. And let Jesus who's standing at the door, knocking at the door of your heart and your mind, let him in. Let him be the savior of your life. Choose thee this day whom you will serve. This is Pastor Marcus Messiah Jarvis, accesstv.org. 
and we sing. 